This is episode 14 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. By now, you know that's Gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, and I know there's a few hundred of you out there because I can see the download stats, I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, please do take a minute to tell a friend. Really, I, I, I really do appreciate everybody listening, and I can see that it's being regularly downloaded by you know a good handful of people. And if you are enjoying it to the point that you've reached this far... Please really do share this with a friend. Put it on social media. Send it by email. I don't care. Just let somebody know. I'd really appreciate getting this out to even more people. So thank you so much for listening. And if you've already done that, uh, please consider leaving the podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. Thanks again. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 31. Unseen University. Fall. 2015. What the hell am I doing, thought Josh, and why here? He was in northern Minnesota, hours from any town he had ever heard of, pulling his white Ford Ranger behind Dale's bar and grill an hour before sundown. He parked between the dumpster and two other vehicles. Both cars were covered in dust. He got out, leaving his gear in the passenger seat, and walked back to the bar's front entrance. Josh stepped inside and gave his eyes a moment to adjust to the dark. The bartender and three people at the bar turned to look at him. He guessed that his darker complexion didn't make him as noteworthy as his age. All three men were at least in their 60s, and he was only 25. They wore jeans, plaid shirts, and mesh baseball caps with Cat and John Deere logos on the front, all faded with age. Josh's nod to them was returned, and he sat himself at the far end of the bar. The bartender came over, wiping his glass with a rag. What can I get you? Got any espresso? Maybe some cronuts? Sorry, this isn't the Twin Cities. You're Lyle? Yep, Josh, right? Did you park behind the bar? Uh, yeah, that's me, he said, pointing out the window. Uh Uh-huh. When you leave here, cross Highway 89 and go due west for two miles. There's a farm and another road to cross. Try to avoid being seen. Where's your gear? How much did you bring? Just what was on the list. It's all in my pack and my truck. Okay. Uh, you have boots? Lyle was looking down at Josh's Chuck Taylors. Yeah, of course. All right, well, you better get a move on. It'll be dark here by the time you get there. How will I know when I've gotten there? Lyle smiled. Oh, don't worry, they'll meet you. Quite the flair for the dramatic, eh? How's that? You know, the cloak and dagger directions, the passphrase, the whole secrecy thing. Lyle glanced at the two regulars who were debating about using live soccer minnows or decoys in their spearhouses over the upcoming winter. After a few weeks out here, you'll be thinking the security measures weren't elaborate enough. Oh, come on, thought Josh, but he said, huh. Okay, well, I better hit the trail then. Good luck and see you in a few weeks. Oh, and uh, leave the keys for your truck before you head out. Josh hesitated for a minute before nodding. Back of the truck, he slipped out of his shoes and laced up his boots, pulling the laces tight and weaving them through the hooks on his nine-inch Irish setter mock tops. The second pair of his favorite boots. The first pair wore out after six years of hard use and a second set of soles. He decided not to tuck his pants into the tops, hoping the wood ticks wouldn't be too bad. It had already been below freezing this fall, so they should have died down. He swung his pack onto his back and snapped the waist belt. He leaned forward and cinched down the strap adjusters. It was nothing fancy, but the pack was a comfortable one in waxed, drab green canvas. Since he didn't have to bring food, it was lighter than usual, tipping the scales at 28 pounds. Before crossing the highway, Josh dropped his keys off with Lyle. He waited for an 18-wheeler hauling stripped pine trunks to pass. He crossed over and skirted a band of trees to avoid a small farmhouse. He walked through a field of waist-high grass that whispered in the light wind, crossed a dirt tree track, and hopped up on a graded gravel road. He had gotten about 400 yards when a car turned onto the gravel road and he stepped into the ditch to the left and slunk behind a tree as the car passed. He was back on the road and made it another quarter mile before having to make his way around a shelter belt of trees protecting another farm. From here on, he had to cross another two-track road and skirt two swamps. As he got close to what he guessed was two miles, he entered a mature forest with tall oaks and only a bit of underbrush. In the open, the sunset was giving way to dusk and here under the trees it started to get dark. Josh had been expecting to see a few buildings, trails, or people at some point, but he could only see forest. Low gusts of wind loosened orange leaves from their branches and filled the air with a faint rustling. Hiya, Josh, said a voice right behind him. He couldn't help flinching before turning around to find himself face to face with Eric. What the? Eric? What are you do? Of course you're here. Am I glad to see you? I was starting to wonder if I missed the rendezvous spot. Nah, you couldn't have gotten lost. We've been following you since you left Dale's. We? asked Josh, looking around. Yeah, there's uh, Jillian over there, and Dan, and behind you is Ashley. Three people appeared from the tree's deep shadows. Each wore bagging clothing in indistinct earth tones and a knitted cap in deep red. 
Jesus, the whole way? I was looking for you. We've been practicing. That's why we're here, after all. Great. Uh, so where exactly is this so-called unseen university? You stole that from Terry Pratchett, right? And the buildings must be new since they weren't on the satellite maps. I'm a huge Pratchett fan, so yeah, it was partially where the name comes from, but it's also descriptive because you're looking at the university right now. The name is mostly a joke since it's just a training camp. We don't have much in the way of buildings or infrastructure, and all that is well camouflaged. You've got four universities, each in a different biome. This is the Winter Forest and Wetland Training Camp. So let's get you to your room, give you a minute to unpack, and then meet up for dinner. Sounds good, said Josh, as he fell in behind Eric, who had started to walk down a lightly used trail to the left. Josh expected the other three to fall in behind them, but as he looked around, he found that they had melted back into the forest. Josh and Eric approached a small hummock on the edge of a clearing. It was about five feet high, twenty feet long, and fifteen feet wide, covered in grass and wild flowers like the rest of the clearing. As he rounded the right side, he saw a ramp descending to a doorway, which was only visible when one got close. It's a bakstuga, said Eric. It's a Swedish half-subterranean cabin with a turf roof. This one is yours while you're here. You'll find a small stove, solar-powered light, a bed, a desk, and a composting bathroom. When you turn on the light, be sure your windows are shuttered at night, or you'll stick out like a sore thumb. The toilet needs to be dumped once a week. I'll show you where later. Once you get settled in, follow this trail to the communal cabin, which is just a bigger backstuga. We've got good moonlight for tonight, so try not to use your flashlight, but it's understandable if you need to find your way the first time. Josh pushed on the solid wooden door and it swung in, heavy but silent. He clicked on his flashlight and shut the door behind him. He swung the beam around the room, finding a switch for the overhead lights, which he clicked on. It was surprising to find a snug, well-lit cabin. Although Eric had enumerated the contents of the cabin, Eric was surprised at the general quality and feel of the place. Everything was made of wood, metal, glass, or cotton. Although the light fixtures were utilitarian, it was clear they had been made with care. The bed design was simple, but again, well-made, as were the chairs and table. The cabin itself was built of timbers that had been stripped of bark and oiled, but not lacquered. He recognized Japanese-style joints where the post beams and rafters met. He felt a little like he had stepped into a hobbit's house in the Shire, but the doors and spaces were rectilinear rather than round. The bathroom was again utilitarian, but well-built. The toilet was a bench with a lidded seat. He recognized the five-gallon bucket composting setup. To the right was a container with sawdust and ash to be tossed in after each visit. He'd used these facilities before and had been surprised by their lack of odor. The sink was a wash basin that could be emptied into the shower drain. The shower design was new to Josh. It looked like a typical single shower except that the user had to step over a two-foot lip to get in. Later he would find out that it was a dual shower and soaking tub with water that could be heated by the sun or a wood stove. There was no electricity other than the lights. He tucked his phone, along with the removed battery and his wallet, into a built-in drawer next to his bed. He had no service here, and phones were not allowed anyway. He unpacked his clothing, organizing his pants, shirts, and underclothes and other layers on the shelves above the drawers. He hung his anorak and backpack on the hooks next to the door. He tossed his notebook and pens into the table and the few books he brought to read on the shelf just above the bed. He stepped out into the cool night, thought better of it, and ducked in his cabin to grab a sweater. The moonlight was plenty bright for him to pick his way along a trail through a grove of poplars. He smelled the big back stuga before he saw it, because somebody was cooking over a wood stove. From the outside, the communal cabin looked similar to his, but bigger and built into a hillside. If he hadn't been looking for it, and had lost a sense of smell, he would have walked right by it. Grasses grew in the clearing right up to where the angle of the roof met the ground. Grasses, moss, bushes, and young trees grew out of the side of the hill, obscuring the outline of the roof. He guessed correctly that the entrance was around the right side, under the only visible overhang. Another heavy door swung on silent hinges. Inside, he found nearly a dozen people. Some bustled in the kitchen area, towards the back wall, while most chatted in clumps, one around the large central table and another group occupying the benches and chairs near the wood stove. Everybody stopped and looked up as he came in. His uncertain hi was greeted with smiling hellos, welcomes, and some waves. Eric got up from near his seat near the wood stove and walked over. Good, you found it. What do you think of the cabin? Cozy. I felt like I was in a Tolkien novel. You're not the first one to say that. Uh, let me introduce you around. He moved back towards the wood stove and Josh followed. You already met Jillian, Dan, and Ashley back in the woods. Dan used to run a landscaping business and has a degree in forestry. He retired. Here Eric made quotation marks in the air with his fingers. And has been with us for a while now. Right now he's a trainer, but he's helping us plan infrastructure that utilizes and mimics plants, like green roofs and forestry that is actually sustainable. Hey, Dan said after giving him a perfunctory nod before turning back to the two young women. Eric had cut part of their conversation. After I worked in the Heinz ketchup factory, I couldn't touch the stuff for years afterward. Dan was the oldest person here. Josh judged him to be in his mid-fifties with short gray hair that had grown sparse on top. Thin and lanky, he had sprawled over one of the back chairs. He talked with his hands and intensity. 
Jillian and Ashley, Eric pointed to the two women, were students of mine. We remained in touch, and when we started to get serious about the project, they joined up. Both women tore themselves away from Dan's ketchup story just enough to smile and nod. Hi, said Jillian, who kept eye contact with Josh a beat longer than he expected. She was fairly tall, with faint freckles and long red hair braided behind her. Ashley was shorter, with cropped blonde hair poking out from under her hat. In the light, Josh could see the drab clothing he had noted on their first meeting in the woods. Sweaters in dark gray, brown, and tan, as well as grubby Carhartt pants that had started out as brown, orange, or dark green before being stained and faded. Each wore a red cap like Eric's. Jillian's had a complex cable-knit pattern. Ashley's was simple felt, and Dan's had smudges and a few neglected tears. Josh looked around the room and noticed that most people wore these odd, slouched wool hats. A few more were left hanging on hooks with their jackets. What's with the red hats? Everybody looks like Papa Smurf. I thought we were supposed to be inconspicuous. They are Phrygian hats. They've been the symbol of liberty since Roman times and revolution since the French one. But yeah, you're right, they do catch the eye. We wear them here for training and later they'll help mark out our comrades as it comes to outright conflict. We do wear red knit caps, hard hats, baseball caps, or bandanas even when out working incognito. If the authorities catch on, we'll have to drop it, but for now it helps us identify ourselves to one another. Publicly, we're all eco-gorillas or deep greens, but internally we have divisions. Here were the Silvestri, or green people. The name comes from the native English insurgency that harried the Norman conquerors. Paul Kingsnorth, you know, the, the Dark Mountain guy, and a few others argue that the green man faces carved on Norman churches represent the guerrilla fighters who lived in the forests. Eric slipped his cap off his head and fingered the thick wool. At any rate, most of us knitted or crocheted these hats ourselves. Ask Jillian over there to show you how if you want. She's one of our better knitters. We generally have the evenings free and a lot of us have projects we work on while hanging out. Okay, let's get to the kitchen area to complete the introductions. This is mostly for your sake, because everybody here knows more about you than you do about them. As they walked to the back of the building, Josh said, Well, that's not true in all cases. I know Lauren, of course. Lauren looked up from her cutting board. Hey, Josh, so glad you made it. Grab ten bowls from under the prep area over there, would you? I'd give you a hug, but my hands are covered in fish. She was wearing a gray t-shirt with cut-off sleeves, probably to show off her Lady Justice tattoo. Have you gotten any new precedents added to your collection? Josh said, pointing to the string of court cases emerging from Lady Justice's robes on her right arm. Nope. Lately, most of the decisions are going the wrong way. I haven't seen you since this summer. You and Eric moved away. I thought you were homesteading up in Wisconsin. I should have known you would be here when I saw Eric. Eric had stepped behind Lauren, putting his arm around her waist. You think I would let him go off to wage war against the industrial machine all alone? Hey, I'm Jair. Glad to meet you. Josh felt his hand being pumped up and down and turned to find a short but tough-looking man with a thick salt-and-pepper beard and hair. Jair is responsible for the amazing fish curry we're going to have tonight, said Eric. He pointed to a woman about Jair's height with brown hair and a big smile. And that's Haley over there, minding the wild rice. They're the other couple here. We all went to grad school together and were underemployed together. Well, us and Dave and Sonny over there. Eric pointed to the big table in the center of the room where two men sat. Their wives are working on other parts of the project. Dave just joined us the other day. The larger man with buzz-cut blonde hair and a beard and glasses nodded at the kitchen crew, and Sonny is one of our trainers. The shorter man, also with a salt and pepper goatee and short dark hair, smiled. He's a vet, so he actually knows what the hell he's doing. The five of us got our PhDs together, though, so we learned more and more about less and less until we knew just about everything about nothing. Dave and Sonny, who had been playing a game of cards and enjoying some dark beer, both shook their heads at Eric. Lauren rolled her eyes and continued the introductions. Sonny's wife, Kate, is an artist, and she's working on what might be called propaganda, but really it's more like subversive street art. Usually she's able to point out some of the worst offenders through satirical and embarrassing installations. Did you see the mock oil spill at BP's American headquarters? That was Kate. Dave's wife, Leslie, teaches at a university out east. She's helping us recruit trustworthy students. Need any help with dinner? asked Dave. Nope, we're almost done, Jair said. Five minutes and we'll start dishing up. This reminded Josh about the bowls, and he hopped to get them set up on the counter next to the stove. Why not have kitchenettes in each of the cabins, he asked. What's more efficient, responded Eric. Ten kitchens, each with a stove, pot, pans, utensils, and food storage, or a shared space where we can have a full-size stove, a variety of pots and pans, and all the food stored in critter-resistant containers. Plus, cooking, eating, and cleaning up together fosters the sense of community we're trying to build. Josh enjoyed dinner around the table with the rest of the crew. Everybody was chatting amiably between bits of fish curry and fresh bread. A few times he thought he caught Jillian looking at him from down the table, but was unsure if it was just wishful thinking. He learned a little bit more about the group and how each person had decided to join up. Some had science backgrounds and understood environmental modeling better than most. Others, like himself, came from the social sciences and had grown concerned about the interaction of humans and technology. Dinner concluded with baked apple tart dessert, tea, and coffee. 
As people finished, they got up and started to clear the table. Soon everybody had congregated in the kitchen and made a cleaning assembly line. As they worked, Eric asked Josh if he was ready for a bit of late-night training. Everybody slowed down their cleaning, stopped their conversations, and carefully looked anywhere but at him. Usually we sit around after dinner. Sometimes people play games, others read, and some just chat by the wood stove. Tonight, though, we've got a bit of a welcome planned. That is, after we've cleaned up, Eric said. Sure, he said, still slightly ill at ease, since everybody was conspicuously uninterested in his answer. Great. Grab your climbing harness after we finish up here, and we'll meet out in front of this bakstuga. Conversations quickly resumed while everybody pitched in to finish cleaning. As they filed out of the bakstuga into the now inky blackness, each person switched on a small, blue-filtered flashlight. Their meager light was nearly the same color as the waning moonlight. Eric pressed one into Josh's hands. See you in a bit, buddy. Josh hustled back to his little cabin and fished out his climbing gear. He slipped it on and pulled a knitted hat onto his head. As he approached the main backstuga, everyone was waiting, some wearing climbing gear and others carrying bulky duffel bags. Okay, let's go. Eric led the way south, deeper into the woods. The moon had gone behind the clouds, and the only things visible in the sea of blackness were the ten small bluish circles cast by their flashlights as they marched on for about ten minutes. We're here, Josh. You and I are going up in this tree. We've got static lines already tied in, and you'll just need some ascenders. Josh pulled out two Jumars. Yeah, those will do, Eric said, pulling out an identical pair. They tied into the ropes, Eric clipped his light to the hem of his sweater, and Josh clipped his to his collar. Josh and Eric started up a Norway pine, the state tree of Minnesota. The trunk was a yard across. The two climbers jugged their way up the climbing ropes and made it up 45 feet before they hit the first branches. At 75 feet, they stood out on a branch, above which another line was tied, leading off into the darkness. Eric pulled out a petzl pulley and slipped it over the line, clipping a locking carabiner onto the pulley's hinging sides. He attached a red webbing to the carabiner and screwed it down. Another carabiner was attached to the webbing, which made a loop about two feet long. Eric attached this to Josh's harness, unhooked his ascenders, and handed him another line. Use this to pull yourself across. Eventually, you'll hit a stop on the top line. I'll call out the next instructions. Oh, and you'll need this. Eric handed him an orange knife with a belt cutter on it and smiled at him. You'll do fine. Josh clipped the knife into a loop on the back of his harness. Josh liked climbing and was comfortable with heights, even if he was used to being on a rock face instead of up in swaying trees. Still, his heart beat faster as he put his weight on the top line and lifted his feet off the branch. The line sagged just a bit, and he started to pull himself across using the second line, hand over hand. About 30 feet out from the tree, his pulley hit a small cord that had been knotted around the top line. Okay, I hit the stop, he called back. All right, let go of the second line. Josh's heart started to beat faster. Uh, okay. The tow line dropped away beneath him. Now take out the knife and use the belt cutter to cut your webbing. Josh thought his heart was racing before, but he could hear it about to burst through his chest. He was thinking fast. They wouldn't haul me all the way out here just to let me drop down to my death, right? Is this even worth it? I could just pull myself back along the top line. No, they must have some netting below or something. Josh? Yeah, I'm just... <sighs> Jesus. Okay, here goes. He reached up with his left hand, holding onto the top line, and used his right to slice through the red webbing holding him up. He held his weight on the top line while he clipped the knife back onto his webbing, and then he grabbed the line with his right hand. He started to move hand over hand past the cord stopper. In a few yards, he found another line tied to the top one. It had a figure eight and a locking carabiner already set up for repelling. Did you cut it? Called Eric. Yeah. You're holding onto the top line, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I am. Sorry, I just didn't want to drop down to nothing. I found the eight, though. Good. I thought you would. Repel on down and I'll see you at the bottom. Josh looked back at Eric's flashlight, which bobbed for a second on the tree and then dropped fast. Too quickly. He had jumped. And after about... 25 feet of fall, the flashlight started to bounce up and down. As Josh rappelled down and drew level with it, he saw Eric laying back in a big circus net, wearing a giant grin. You didn't think we'd let you just fall down seven stories, did you? Well... Josh and Eric descended, the former rappelling and the latter sitting in the net, which was being lowered by unseen hands. The next day, Josh would see the whole setup, complete with ropes supporting the net and a belay system for letting it down. What in the hell was that? Josh had reached the bottom and everyone surrounded him. All were wearing big smiles and Sonny clapped him on the back. Ever hear of the OSS? asked Sonny. Josh shook his head. The Office of Strategic Services was the precursor to the CIA. It was started during World War II to train secret agents to work behind enemy lines, mostly in Europe and Southeast Asia, arming Ho Chi Minh. Their training happened at a place called The Farm. You just went through one of their tests. Their recruits had to climb up a ladder to the top of a darkened barn. Then they were told to hang on a bar over what they thought was a three-story drop and let go. Most did and landed on a platform just a few feet below them. They became field operatives because they followed orders. Some said to hell with it and climb back down the ladder. These people ended up working as analysts. A few kept moving down the bar and found another ladder that led to the roof. 
they became field commanders because of their ability to think on their feet, or hanging by their fingernails over a deadly drop, in this case. Ah, I see. A bit of hazing and testing right off the bat. Yep, Eric's net had just reached the ground. I didn't think you'd back down, but I wasn't sure if you'd just drop or if you'd continue climbing down the line. This isn't the only information we use to distinguish the various roles people will play, but it's fun to see how everybody reacts to a bit of stress. Don't worry, you'll get to see how next week's newcomer fares. Just one person comes in each week? asked Josh. Usually, said Sonny. Most people are here for about ten weeks, so every week we get a new person just after someone has left. Occasionally people stay for longer, especially if they're getting specialized training or, like me, they're here for months to help train people. You asked why we would call it a university before, Eric said. Part of the reason is that we've set up the training in a way that's kind of like a liberal arts curriculum, a core set of topics that everybody learns and then specialized learning in areas where the student excels. Everybody learns basic communications, orienteering, small arms, hand-to-hand combat, concealment, first aid, wilderness survival, and fitness. Then you might get some specific training in explosives, information gathering, or whatever role you're going to be taking on. Guns and fighting? I thought we were nonviolent. Yeah, well, (laughs) our absolute top priority is protecting people and ecosystems, Dave said. All of our targets are property and infrastructure, and we'll do our damnedest to avoid hurting anybody. Sometimes, though, we might need to temporarily incapacitate or disarm those who stand in our way. Without small arms trainings, you can't strip a handgun and make it unusable. We mostly use pepper spray paintball guns to incapacitate. If you don't learn some combat skills, you might hurt yourself or others if it comes to a struggle. This isn't boot camp. You're not here to lose your personal identity or beliefs, Jillian said. If there's something you don't think you should be doing, tell someone. Part of the reason we come in one at a time is to avoid groupthink or mob mentality of a combat unit. Also, it helps us to practice working with people of different abilities and skill sets. Plus, for example, I'll get to teach you some of the skills that I've been learning, and that helps me too. Okay, cool, because I don't think I could kill someone. As much as I know we need to succeed in this, I won't kill over it. Josh, that's how most of us feel, said Lauren. All of our plans have at least double or triple safeguards in place to avoid hurting anybody. We'd rather fail than have somebody injured from one of our actions. Of course, we run the risk of the whole country descending into chaos and violence, but we've been working on a type of psychological project to try and minimize that risk. But it's still there. We might be opening Pandora's box. We should probably pack up the gear and get back to camp. Eric stepped out of his climbing harness. We've got a busy day tomorrow, Josh. We usually get rolling around 6.30 for our morning workout. We'll be jogging and doing push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, you know, all the ups. Plus yoga and hand-to-hand stuff on alternate days. Tomorrow's yoga, I think, led by Jillian. I think I'm on for Aikido for the next day, and Sunny, you'll cover some of the more mixed martial arts training the next day. So dress accordingly. If you want something to eat beforehand, swing by the kitchen, but we'll have our main breakfast around 8 o'clock after we've had a chance to shower and get ready for whatever we're doing later in the day. In the morning, we work to provision or improve the camp, and right now we're building a new cabin. After lunch, we'll get into more training. I think we're concentrating on orienteering and communications, but we'll also practice the other skills we've learned. With that, they hiked through the darkened woods, splitting up to find their separate cabins as they reach camp. Josh thought he'd have trouble falling asleep, but he slipped into a deep unconsciousness right after reading just a few lines of the Monkey Ranch Gang, leaving the small light over his bed to burn all night. End of chapter. End of episode 14 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs> <laughs>